Amen. This morning, I just wanted to continue a little bit in the theme that Sue's been um, sharing. I thought last week she shared a great, um, a great message about being authentic, and and so I just wanted to sort of unpack my version of that a little bit different to Sue. But you know, in um, if you look up the word authentic in the dictionary, it comes up with the word genuine, original, real, actual, bona fide, true, veritable. And so the word authentic is really about being real. And I remember um, some years ago I was in, over in Thailand and um, I went into, into Myanmar, which we used to do a lot. I don't tend not to do these studies as often, but we, we would go in and we'd sort of wander around the market. And back in those days I was a bit naive, you know, and I was walking around the market, and in the market of um, Teshlik, they've got all these amazing stalls selling all sorts of things, you know. You can buy anything, buy guns and all sorts of stuff, you know. And most, most of it's not real. Most of it's artificial, fake, you know. But um, what tends to happen is we get attracted by how things seem. Have you ever figured that out, that we, we look at something and we think, no, that can't be fake? Well, I went into this particular stall and they were selling these mi microphones, similar to the microphone we use here. And they were called, they were Shaw microphones. In fact, they had all sorts of different brands in this particular place, you know. And um, anyway, long story short is I talked myself into buying this set of microphones, you know. And they, they were in a case that had Shaw written on, on the outside and it looked really classy and, and um, you know, it was, they were good, you know. I thought, gee, I did a good deal. And I think I paid a couple of hundred dollars for them. They weren't cheap. And when I brought them back to Australia and I thought, you know, I've done a really good deal. And so I got on the Shure microphone website and it didn't exist. <laughs> it wasn't actually a copy. It was a whole new version. They'd taken their brand and put it on something else, you know. And when we plugged these things in, only half of them worked. One mic worked, the other one didn't. Well, actually worked sometimes, you know. And they got relegated down into the, into the cafe downstairs in the old building, and we used it there. But, but it was a lesson. It was a lesson for me, you know, because we get attracted by what we see with our eyes. Who knows that? We look at stuff and, and we think, yeah, that's the real deal. But I've learnt now when I go into Myanmar and walk along and I look in all the, all the wonderful markets and I look at all the things they're selling, it's all fake. Like if you want to buy a handbag, like I'm not into handbags but my daughter's into handbags and we would go in and you know you'd think I'll buy a gift and, but they're not real. I'm like, like they might look like the real deal but they're not. They're just made somewhere in some random little factory and buy a problem probably some little person who's taking advantage of the brand and, and they're just simply not real. And I, I felt like, you know, I'd got a real lesson in authenticity back in that time. Don't trust what you see with your eyes. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says, um, I'm reminded of the authentic faith which was, which was lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I'm sure that this faith is also inside of you. Because of this, I'm reminding you to revive God's gift that's in you through the laying on of my hands. Because God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, it really struck home to me that we can allow things simply because there's an anointing on them when sometimes the spirit of God is not on them. You know, the Bible tells us the gifts of God are without repentance. Does anyone know what that means? They're irrevocable. So if you get a gift on your life, that gift will flow regardless of where you go. Now, that's a scary thought, but it's so important you understand they're gifts. It's a gift. It wasn't earned. It wasn't because you were good enough. It wasn't because you were great. God says, hey, I'm going to give you this because you're holy enough. Now, it was because you pressed in and got it from God. Now, the problem is, of course, with that, is if we choose not to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord, that gift can be seen or used in a way that's quite corrupting. 
for the body of Christ. And I feel in talking today about authenticity, it's such a big deal for us to line our lives up with the very anointing that God has put upon us. Because, you know, we're all going to stand before heaven. We're all going to give account for the things we've done down here. But, you know, these gifts, these are not earned. And what we tend to do, particularly in Pentecostal environments, is we, people that have extraordinary gifts, we give huge places of authority because of their gift. And I want to say to you this morning, we've got to be careful with that. Because I believe we're moving into a day where God is wanting to expose that which is not founded on the righteousness of God. Now, does that mean God's only going to use holy people? No, because he always chooses to use weakness. He chooses to use vulnerability. But, but it's when we hide those things and it becomes a religious culture. I want you to turn today to the book of 1 Samuel. I just want to unpack some things and I won't go for too long. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And this is a scripture that we've talked about a lot, so I won't unpack it for too long, but it's a good scripture. 1 Samuel 16, and reading from verse 5, and it says, And he said, and now this is the story of, of um, the prophet being sent to, to anoint the replacement for Saul. We all know the story. And he said, Peacefully, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice and he consecrated Jesse and his sons and he invited them to the sacrifice and so it was when they came he looked at Eliab and he said surely the Lord's anointed is before me but the Lord said to Samuel do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him for the Lord does not see as man sees for God look for man looks on the outward but the but the Lord looks on the heart and then Jesse called Abimadab made him pass before Samuel and he, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shamar pass before him. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the, are all the young men here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is out keeping the sheep. Now, we all know the story. Eventually David gets brought in and David gets anointed as the replacement. Now, this young man at that point had not done anything. He was probably 16 years old. And yet God had seen something in David that was unique. But I want to look at this passage here just for a few minutes. It says, For God sees not, at man, not as man sees, but the Lord looks at the out... For, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, this is interesting because... We've got Samuel, and he is in this place, standing there before this group of men, and he thinks in his heart, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And he's standing there, and he's looking at this muscular young man, and he thinks, this is the guy. Surely this is the guy that God has got. And suddenly there's an internal voice now, the way we read it, it almost seems like God's standing next to him. But just remember, he's a prophet from God. And he's got two voices going on inside of him. He's got his own voice that says, hey, you look like the real deal. And God's saying, I have rejected him. Now, don't take this personal, Steve. But what's going on inside of this prophet right now is these two voices. Anybody ever had two voices going on? That can be pretty tough. Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. I have rejected him. Oh. And that's the problem, you know. Sometimes when we think something, God thinks another thing. You ever figured that out? In his human spirit, he sees then the word of the Lord comes to him, which is the opposite. And this creates in him, I believe, a tension. I just want to think about for a few moments. Two opposing points of view inside the same man. It kind of can make you feel a little bit like torn internally. The natural 
and the Spirit. You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we know it very well, the word of the Lord is, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow and the sooner and thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, the soul, the soul of man is our mind, our will, and our emotions. Say that together. Our mind and our will and our emotions. Who has emotions here this morning? Who's completely unemotional? You know, in Galatians chapter 5, it says, walk by the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the desires of the human flesh or the, or the soul realm. And you know, what I want to just suggest to you this morning is God is looking for a people that are fully in surrender to him. Now, this, is, this creates a tension. Because we have within side of us this human thing that's called humanity that wants us to do well, wants us to prove ourselves, wants us to be the best version of ourselves. And then we have the Spirit of God that speaks inside of us at times that brings us to a place that might seem incongruous with what's going on. Who's ever thought that when God says something to you, it doesn't sound like what you were about to do? I have. I think I'm about to do this. And God says, no, don't do that. <laughs> Sorry. And you know, friends, this is the tension that we live in as believers. It's this tension that God wants us to wrestle with so that we become authentic in our walk with God, authentic in our place with heaven. The Bible talks about a still, small voice, a place in our heart where there's a gentle whisper. Rarely God speaks volumes. It's in quietness that God speaks to you. He might say something like, trust me, it's going to be okay. But rarely he'll come along, I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen here. But what tends to happen is that part of us, that soul realm inside of us, fills in the blanks. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we know in part and we prophesy in part. When the perfect comes, we'll know all things. And I want to suggest to you this morning that God only gives us a part of of the solution. You know why? Because he wants us to grow. There's this tension in being a son or a daughter of God. And he doesn't tell you the whole picture. He only tells you the next step. And what we tend to do is fill in the blanks. We think, well, if you're doing that, then obviously that must be the next bit. And as soon as you get to the obviously, I can tell you, you're moving into the soul realm. Yeah. This is when we start to make mistakes as believers. We start to listen to what we think is fairly obvious. But God didn't tell us the next step. He simply told us to walk by faith. And you know why he does that? He does it to mature us. There's this crazy tension of being faithful with the little we've got. If God says, trust me, He's saying, where you are right now might seem really radical, really awful, but that simply means I want you to know I've got this. One of the things he often says to me is, Mark, I've got this. I hate it when he says it to me because it means he's going to look after it. I don't want you to do anything. And the problem with our human spirit, especially those of us who like to put things in boxes. Now, who likes to put things in boxes? Come on. Put your hand up. Who likes to have things resolved? It's a human thing in us. We want to see, well, if that's, that's the part, then that must be the next journey. But God says, no, I only showed you a piece because I wanted you to trust me. And it's all about developing the character of heaven. Authenticity. Get back to our subject. 
is about being trustworthy to heaven. And I believe being trustworthy is being willing to go with the little we have and stop until God tells us the next bit. And I've been around churches long enough to know that when we take to a logical conclusion, what God shows us in part creates religion. And religion always, always ends up blocking God out and putting man in a place of authority. As we surrender to him and start to walk in the spirit, we allow the, the word of God. You know, I, I can't overestimate this, overstate this rather. The word of God must be our strength. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him or I won't sin against him. You know, friends, the word of God must be the strong part. The enemy knows if he can get you to function in emotion, you're in the soul realm. If he can get you to... And, and let's face it, we all get into emotion. Emotion, well, I don't feel good about this. Well, that's got nothing to do with it. And I can tell you right now, if I went by my feelings, I would have quit this church many years ago. I'm being honest. Because my feelings tell me, I'm done with this. I'm over this. I don't want to have, do this anymore. And I've learned as soon as I follow my emotions, I get into trouble. My mind, I start to follow my mind. And my mind says, surely God would want us to do this. And so I do this and I find out I've built a great big pile of bricks that God wasn't in. I remember a few years ago, I remember we had this opportunity to do some stuff in our, in our ministry training college. We got involved with all this stuff with the government and it was really successful. It brought a whole lot of money in, you know. And I remember after it all went pear-shaped, which it did, I'm being honest, it was tough. You know, we went through a real tough time and I was out walking with the Lord one day <coughs> and I felt him start to say to me, Mark, what you built there is now bearing <laughs> and I realised what I'd made a decision with some years ago had gone through some, some years of process and all of a sudden we were now bearing the fruit of what I'd done. It wasn't God, but well, God used it. He stood back and says, well, Mark's going to learn a really good lesson here. Look how much he's going to grow. <laughs> was he being nasty? No, he was using what I do to teach me a really valuable lesson. And I, I, I'm not sure about you, but if I make a really bad mistake, I, I'll chalk that one up and I'll say, well, I'm not going to do that again. I ain't going to go there again. And I remember going through that experience and thinking, oh, God, what I thought you were in. What, it was a door that presented in the natural that seemed like God at the time. It seemed like this surely is the right thing for me to do. Now, I'm just being real vulnerable here by saying that, but when I, when I look back, it took me on a journey that we really shouldn't have taken. And it took us down this road. It wasn't that we weren't supposed to train people. It was all about how it was to happen. It was about how we were supporting that and how we allowed that to influence us. But I had to learn a very, bad, very valuable lesson, not to listen to my human spirit. So... Because I'm strong. I can be really, I can be really determined. Who, who's like that? Here? You know? I can be really strong sometimes. And, and I've learnt, you know, I've got to surrender that, you know. My opinion, my opinion gets in the way so often. My thoughts on something just stop me when I... And so, friends, can I suggest... When you're in a place where you think, well, God wants me to do this because I've got to please him, then challenge that in your heart because God never wants you to please him. You already do please him. You're his son, you're his daughter. When we do things out of a, a sense of trying to earn God's love or out of trying to impress or impress others or impress the world or even attract God, 
I believe we operate in a human way that ultimately will lead to religion, which is not authentic. Because the Bible tells us man looks on the outward. Now, this is the challenge, and I will finish. It says, he looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. And so what we tend to do is we spend all our energy perfecting the outward. And this pr produces this performance culture that makes us want to play a role. This, this culture that, that says, you know, all I've got to do is make sure other people see the way I do this and I'll impress them. You know, the heart, the motives are the real drivers. Imagine if we could see from God's perspective. If we could see how things are. If we could meet people and see the real drivers in their heart. You know, religious culture happens in all churches. All churches. Because it's the nature of humanity. How impressive, how spiritual. But the Lord doesn't look on what we're doing. He looks on why we're doing it. If it's to impress, if, if it's to gain advantage, then it has no value in heaven to be authentic is to be willing to be vulnerable or even seem weak you know religious culture hides it protects it makes smoke streams you know hallelujah glory to god amen brother sister hallelujah you know well oh, can't touch that Have you ever been in a church where you kind of feel this kind of reverence I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying sometimes it actually protects you from seeing the truth. You know, the Catholic Church, and I don't want to be critical, but here, what's been through with this sexual stuff, it's all been hidden behind this smoke screen, this veneer of you can't touch that, we're priests. Don't come near us, we're, we're holy men. No, actually, what you did was wrong. And what this thing, for, however it's happening, is exposing the truth. And I want to say to you this morning, God is looking for people that are willing to be real, willing to be open to the truth. You know, to be authentic is to be a part of the culture of the kingdom that I believe God is breathing on the earth. You know, Sue shared it last week and Andrew the week before. And, and I believe part of that culture of authenticity is to be transparent. It's to be vulnerable and I believe one of the signs of of true heaven culture is vulnerability you know none of us like to look weak and, and and foolish in front of other people and so what we tend to do is we put on this brave front hey, amen I can do that amen and then we call that faith but actually faith if it's not based in what God says it's actually based in a human spirit. Now, I'm saying some stuff that might even affect you here, but you need to be careful if I'm doing it and calling it faith, but it's actually me hiding something. It's me hiding a truth. And I, and I, I, I believe we need to walk by faith. But let's not pretend that God, that someone's dying. Let's, let's stand with them and say, let's believe God's going to heal you. But if he chooses not to, you're going to be with him. Amen. But it's not, it's not healthy to say, I'm not going to even talk about he's going to die. That's not faith. That's denial. It's actually unhealthy. It's not good, friends. And I want to say what we sometimes call faith is something else. It's kind of this religious veneer that says, no, I'm not going to say that in case it happens. Get away, devil. Get away, evil, bad person. You know, um, religion is this hyperactive spirituality. And, and it's like on the surface, amen, but under, under the water, the legs are gone, <laughs> trying to keep afloat, you know. <laughs> Anybody met someone like that? Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Shall I? Glory to God. After the prophet had been told to reject all of Jesse's son, the final one, the youngest one, the most unqualified one, 
was chosen. David was unique in his generation. And it was simply because of one thing. It was his heart. It was his heart. And friends, I want to finish with this, but God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at our behaviour even. Yes, your behaviour comes out of your heart, but he looks at the heart. And the Bible tells us, I have found a man that has a heart after me. How did he know that? Because he was only like a kid. He was like 16. And he found him out on the, out on the wherever, the, part, you know, the, the hill with his sheep, playing his harp, singing to God. In that place was going, hey, God, I, I don't have all the answers, but I just surrender to you. A heart after God is saying, I want your will more than I want my will. I, want, I don't care what it costs me. I want to be the person you're calling me to be. You know, if we saw things from God's perspective, like David did, I believe, all through the book of Psalms, it talks about his vulnerability, his weakness, his sin. You know, we all know about David's sin. He fell with Bathsheba. And you could say, well, look how evil he was. But God's love for this young man was so astounding. You know, David was a murderer and an adulterer. And yet Jesus was called the son of David. Now that's nuts. I want to say, that'll affect your religious spirit right now. Hang on a minute. Jesus is so holy. Yeah, but he's the son of a murderer and an adulterer. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say that. If that offends you, you know, G Jesus actually say, says um, the Pharisees, they, they, um, <laughs> they, they spit, he said, it, they spit out a, um, I was trying to think of it, spit out a gnat, but they swallow a camel. What's a gnat? A tiny little thing. <laughs> spit that thing out, but then they swallow a dirty, great, big, huge camel. Religious culture accepts hidden stuff as long as it's got all the pretends around it but then it'll spit out something else. I've had people come up to me and say, you shouldn't be singing that song in this church because the words are not holy enough. And then I look at them and I think, yeah, but you're living in sin. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that to, them, their, to their face, but the reality is that's spitting out a, a gnat and swallowing a camel. When we start to judge by the way we see things. And recently I've been... And I, I won't do it, I had, had it here, but I, I've been recently reading the book of Psalms. I really felt the Lord take me into the book of Psalms. I'm trying to read a couple of Psalms a day, and it's so cool. You know, I'm starting to realize how David loved the Lord. Can I really encourage you to do that? Get the book of Psalms and realize he was so vulnerable before God. He was so genuine. He was so honest. He was so truthful. He recently, I... I saw a, an interview with Brian Houston. And Brian Houston's the pastor of Hillsong Church in America, in, in, sorry, in Sydney. And it's become a worldwide phenomenon, you know. And he's, he's an amazing guy and, and praise God for Brian Houston. But, you know, to be totally honest, he hasn't always been one of my favorite people. I've been thinking, yeah, you know, whatever. But I saw him on this television program and he was being interviewed by this guy and he started to tell the story of the fact that his father had been a pedophile. And it was, oh, I was going, whoa. <laughs> I don't know if you know the story, but Frank Houston had been one of the spiritual leaders of our movement in this country. And he eventually got, um, it was all hushed up, actually. It all hushed up. He, he lost his credential and it all went away. And, and Frank died in ignominy. No one knew what happened to him, really. It was sort of rumor. It was, no one ever told the story out loud. And, and here's Brian on American television being interviewed by this guy and he said, you know, back in 19, whatever it was, I needed to, I need to, to take my, the credential off my father. He said, it was the hardest day of my life. He said, my father was a pedophile. He'd been, and like, he, he publicly outed his dad. In, and, I'm, and I was watching this, you know, and I, and I felt in my spirit, this man stepped from being 
a leader to being a statesman in a, in a conversation because suddenly he, he made himself vulnerable before the world. Now, I don't know about, it really affected me. When I watched it, I thought, wow, he just stepped into authority. And I want to say to you this morning, you want to be authentic? Start to be real. Start to be honest about your stuff. About, yes, I've struggled with this thing, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay now. No, praise the Lord, brother, I'm over it. Hallelujah, glory to God. Well, you know, I mean, that's nice. But what's really going on? What's really happening? Is that offensive to you? It's all about the heart. The Bible tells us his, ro his eyes roam to and fro throughout the world looking for those whose hearts are perfect before him. And I want to just say that to, as we finish. I want to be authentic. That's my hunger to be authentic. You know, I, this wasn't my sermon choice, but I, I was thinking about it. And I was thinking, you know, it's, the, it's, it's, it's so important to me. It's a value I have. I want to be real. I don't want to be a guy that gets to the end and I had all this stuff that I pretended I did. I want to be able, able to say I'm authentic. And heaven says, but you were authentic in what you did. You treated people with respect. You know, one of the things as pastors you find out, and this is not a, this is not a, a have a go at someone in this church, trust me, but we've seen this. People can be really nice to you because you're the pastor but they can be different to someone else because they're not the pastor. And we've found after, over the years, people would come to us and they'd seem really good and really fine, and then we'd hear stories, oh, they're, they're horrible, they're really mean, or they're rude. And what they're doing is they're playing to you because you're the leader. Has anybody ever met someone like that? We haven't got people here like that, but we've been in situations like that in the past. And I don't know about you, that really frightens me. I want to be the same I am with you or the, the homeless guy on the street or with the person that's got the most respect in the church. I want to treat them exactly the same. That's being authentic. That's important to, to heaven and I believe it's important to God. And I want to say it's important to Frankston life. Let's all stand. I believe, Lord, that you're bringing us to a place of being honest, of being vulnerable. Not, Lord God, being that someone that will hide things behind a religious veneer, but someone, Father God, that's willing to be even honest at our, at our cost, Lord. Even be honest at our, at our weakness, Lord. Help us not to hide, but help us to be genuine. I pray that in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.